All right, here we come. Here we come in the house. I'm curious if people had reflections on our inquiry practice last week around what is health, what is disease, what is healing, what is the role of healers, what is the role of doctors? I'd love to see in the chat. So what we're going to, what we're doing today really is just straight on up. We haven't had like a straight up laser coaching session. So laser coaching on any, on anything we talk about in Body Thrive, on embodied wisdom, body habits, intermittent fasting, any of the 10 habits, earlier, lighter dinner, earlier to bed, start the day right, breath, body practices. Plant-based diet, sitting in silence, self-massage, sense organ self-care, healthier eating guidelines, or easeful living. So I want to miss the call. Need to go back and watch. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a powerful exercise. I really think it helps us define who we are and what what we value, what we want to know, what we want to know next, what we want to how we want to live next how we think. One of the things that I find is there's such strong, I think there's always been very strong narratives. And now we have so much choice as to what narratives we're tuned into, what narratives we, what we believe. And it can just be helpful to find your way with, with that. I'd say one thing that as I play with language a lot, being a writer, I question language a lot and I've used the term body wisdom for, I don't know, my guess is close to, close to 18 years, long time, you know, but when you like really trace your own, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit of a thought leader. So I, I trace my own concepts back and concepts I pick up from others. And where I've really landed this week is around embodied wisdom, not body wisdom, embodied wisdom. And what's the difference between body wisdom and embodied wisdom? Well, a couple letters, but what does it mean to embody your wisdom? Like what does that have to do? And what, what does that have to do with time? And what does that have to do with the process of growing up or the process of aging? It's like our, our, our cells should get smarter. We should get smarter in our bodies over time. So that's a, that's a belief I have. And there's not that much difference between body wisdom and embodied wisdom, but, but there kind of is a nice refinement in that, in that language. Look, like, are you embodying the wisdom that you know? And that's always the hardest thing. That's always where the rubber meets the road, right? It's like, you know, and do you act in, in your own best self-interest based on lessons learned, based on what you know from the past? All right. So laser coaching, what's going up? What's hard? What's easy? All right, Judy. All right, I'll do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why we're here. Exactly. Okay, laser coaching on. So looking at what you were talking about last time and just now. Yeah. About how I how we feel about the, the medical, about doctors and all that. And how do I do this quickly? Going through a bunch of stuff, going for a bunch of medical tests. Ayurvedic allopathic doctor wants me on the bone drugs, thyroid problem, bone, bones are deteriorating. It's just all this stuff going on. And I really, it's this, it's this, I know that I, you talk about embodying, I do not want to take these drugs. I have taken these drugs. They did not make me feel good. I want to do the, I want to do UT. I want to do my exercise, which I have upped. I have, I want to feel stronger in my convictions. Mm. 
and not think that I making a poor choice and that I'll wake up one day in a puddle as an invertebrate, you know, like I, I want to, <laughs> I just pictured that. So yeah, all that stuff and, yeah. and everybody else too. Like, I don't even tell people sometimes, you know, in, in my family, my, my, my partner, like, I don't even say, yeah, the doctor called me back and said, you better take the bone drugs mm-hmm. and all that, because I don't want to I feel like when I try to explain what I, why I don't want to take them, yeah. I'm wishy-washy. Yeah. You know, okay. Yep. And that's, I think that's another, so I'll just go through for those who missed last week, because we might keep referencing this. And if you're like, what happened last week? I missed it. <laughs> we, we went through a very simple inquiry practice around what are your, what are your beliefs? And, and the reason is I want I want everyone to be able to articulate your own beliefs because we're living in a, we're living in a time where it's interesting, right? There's, I mean, in the past, people would more or less take on the beliefs of their community because it's the only community they had exposure to. And a lot of communities were fairly monocultural and we still experience this today. I mean, when I travel, I've traveled a lot in my life. I think I've, I've probably been in over 20 countries. And so I've had exposure to a lot of different cultures and a lot of different languages and a lot of different traditions. And, and, and the, the tendency within cultures is, is, to, is to have a concentrated set of beliefs and to perpetuate those over time. And it's what creates a strong culture. It's not as it good, it's not as it bad. It's just like, what, 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 is, what is it? So when you're able to move between cultures, you transcend cultures, and then you can say, well, there's beliefs over here and there's beliefs over here and there's beliefs over here. And what are the beliefs that I will, I, I, I'm I choosing for myself to anchor my actions? And what are the experiments I wanna run next to make sure that I'm testing my beliefs into reality? And so the yogis have used this as a technique over time. Do you need me? Okay to test their assumptions and to debate and to elevate their beliefs as have numerous other communities, mystic based communities that were seeking truth more than perpetuating culture. So the questions were, what are your beliefs about your body, about your mind, about healing, about aging, about disease, about dying, about healers, about doctors, about setting goals and about achieving goals. And we did this slowly over the course of an hour. And then the question, the ending question was, what is the opportunity at the crossroads of your life right now? So the opportunity that Judy's facing at the crossroads is, from what I'm hearing, and I'll just reflect back and then Judy, you can correct me, but it sounds like the crossroads is, do I follow what I believe or do I do what this specific culture that's predominant in this time space reality that I'm in do what is do- in the dominant culture right now, even though it goes against my belief? Is that, am I in, <clears throat> does that resonate, Judy? It does with one slight caveat, which yeah. is because I've, been raised in a specific culture yeah and i will bring in your program other programs here and there yeah is being really really certain that i am believing in myself listening to everybody else but really believing in myself and what i truly truly think is the right thing for me because there's so much input and and am I you know am I doing the the correct strong thing that's that's right for me and not just for everybody else and all that so am I doing the right thing am I can I trust what is it my amygdala can I trust myself 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. because what we know too, from your sharing in the past, like this is, this is like a new power that you're finding in yourself is to trust yourself. Is that, is that resonate? Is that true? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So that's, a, that's an important data point for me because if someone's always just been rebelling against their culture, it really changes things rather than if someone's felt like overwhelmed by culture in the past and that culture's really steered their decision-making and, and that's ended up in a place that has been, we'll say lack lost, lackluster on the personal empowerment front, something like that, left something to be desired. And it's a different type of a conversation. The other big factor to me that comes up often with decision making when we're when we don't know what to do. And I love I love the language and the women Diane Stein wrote this book. I think it's out of print, but I think you can still get old copies on Amazon called The Women's I Ching. So it's like there's the I Ching and that's great. And then there's different translations and variations on it. And and I particularly like her language about these times when you don't when you don't know like these uncertain times uncertain times where you don't know and so in a culture that doesn't really have very good language around the in-between times the in-between clarity i feel like we live in a culture right now that's very much like choose do it take action just do it right like nike i was talking with it was Claudia Huber, who's in yoga health coaching. She used to work for Adidas in sales and, and marketing before she went into health and wellness. And she was saying that Adidas could never supersede Nike as like the number one athletic shoe company <laughs> because of the branding. Because like Nike just nailed it with a branding of just do it. So just do it is like just take the drugs or just don't take the drugs. And what what wisdom texts like the I Ching, which have been, you know, they stood the test of time. It's at least a couple thousand years old that this oracle type tool has been used to help people, you know, tap into their intuition. It's basically an int a tool that helps awaken intuition. It says, well, yeah, there's times to move forward and there's times to wait. So it's not always just do it. And you can always just do it, right? You can always just take the drugs. You can always just start doing urine therapy. You can always just do the next thing, but you can also set a timeline and say, you know what? I'm just not gonna do anything for two months. I'm not gonna make a decision. I'm gonna strengthen my personal power. I'm just gonna do the things that I know work now. And then I'll reevaluate this decision in a couple months. Now, you can also set parameters. And this is a very good way to build deep energy. So anyone who's having trouble with building OGIS or deep energy is you can give yourself your own parameters, your own boundaries. And one way that yogis and mystics have done this over time is with limiting speech. So you just say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to only not entertain the thoughts about this. I'm also going to demonstrate I'm not entertaining thoughts about this by not talking about it with other people. It's very powerful to do this. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're trying to build potency around something, you can actually limit your speech around it. So you can say, well, I'm not going to make a decision on the drugs or not drugs. And, you know, and, and then, and for, you know, I just picked two months, like you might choose six months, you might choose a year, you might choose three months, like just like kind of play with the idea of there's a chunk of time that you can intuitively access and just say, you know what, I'm going to table it for a few months. Be specific. We'll say three months right now. I'm gonna think I'm gonna table this for three months. I'm not gonna think about the choice. And I'm not gonna talk to anyone about this choice. What I am gonna do, just do it, is everything I know that works. I'm just going to be in integrity 
as much as I can with that which I know to be true for me right now. Now, you can tell if that's a good decision because you'll feel a sense of exhalation. You'll feel a release. You'll feel your, you'll feel your kidneys actually like rise up in support on your backside in a way that the exhale can release downward where you're just like, oh, I feel like there's a weight off my chest. Just buy my, bought myself some time to make this decision about starting the drugs. How does that sound? What I like about this is that, yeah, you know, with my Vata personality, with my OCD and gerbil wheel brain, I do think about these things a lot. Should I, shouldn't I, who should I say, don't say, blah, blah, all that. And that causes undue stress, which is not helpful for anything. And, and I do that. And so I have been going years without, I took it once years ago, but now I've been going years without, with listening to everybody saying, take it, take it, take it. And I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. And so just the idea of saying, I will not be discussing this, thinking about this you know, because my tendency throughout my life has been to be quiet, like you're saying, was to be quiet, just sit there and be stubbornly not do what people want me to do, but hmm. just think about the fact that I'm doing that too much, not just settle with it. Think about it too much. Think about, okay, I'm stubborn. I'm not doing this thing because I want to, this is the only way I can have control over anything in my life is by not doing the thing. <laughs> and I think, oh, I'm not doing the thing. Is that the right decision? So what good is that? So yeah, so this this does sound good. Yeah, yeah it changes it because you have to do everything that's working that you know intuitively and physiologically are working. Mm -hmm. So for example, Indy and I were on the beach two days ago and we did a, a workout. I'm putting air quotes around working out. <laughs> she named it a workout. And we were doing, we did the, uh, we did, so what's, what's kind of cool about USA Gymnastics is it's a very codified workout. Like they do the same, they do, like everyone does the same things. So we did the, we did their like ab and leg, like their warm up. I'm sore, by the way. I knew I was going to be sore because I was like, oh shit, like, right, gymnastics. <laughs> okay. I'm not 14. It was awesome. And then I ran yesterday. I'm like, I'm starting to be able to run again, which is very exciting because I've, I've always loved running. And with the recovery of my shin bone, I'm starting to be able to do that without repercussions. So then the next day I like ran on the beach for a couple of miles, which was super fun. But like running in sand, those who are runners know that like there's some different muscles that you use when you run on sand. So in any case, we're, we're doing the, the workout and Indy says, oh, I forget that it feels great to work out. Like she had forgotten that because like she has to work out when we're back home. And then she's kind of had a bit of a break, although we did a ton of hiking and a lot, we've done a lot of walking and a lot of hiking, but we haven't done like a workout and she just forgot. But that means when she remembers that, that means that she's got to remember, like, I like to work out, which is in action. And so that's the hardest thing is it's like embodied wisdom is where you have to live it. You have to, you have to do the things that you know, and many of you know that fasting works. Many of you know that getting your ass in bed early works. And you know that like getting up and doing a movement practice works. And you know that like a certain level of hydration is favorable. So that's where the rubber meets the road is it's, just, it's not just this like carte blanche. You don't have to make a decision. It's actually, this is a very intense path. It's a very edgy path. If you have to live the wisdom that you know, and if part of this wisdom, and this is really edgy, is that I will not entertain these types of thoughts because these types of thoughts 
deplete ojas. And the yogis and the vaidyas, so from the Vedic tradition, they were very clear about these teachings. It's like, if your mind is spinning, you are burning the, the, the depth of integrity of your immune system. You're either dispersing it or you're burning it. And so what does this mean? This is so fascinating how resting in easeful awareness is a practice. It's a choice. It's a habit. And so Judy's keystone habit with this. Oh, I have a, I have a new photo of a keystone. I was when I was walking. I'm going to see if I can get this onto our screen pretty easily. It was so cool. My little walk today, my big walk today. I, I, there's an old Roman arch with a keystone in the middle. <laughs> The one that holds the arch up. And then there was a sundial in the town so that you can tell what time it is just based on light. It's so cool. So Judy's keystone habit for this is easeful living. And this is deep. This is a hard habit to do, but it gets right to the core of the issue of the nervous system. So if the nervous system is dispersing energy, it's hard for bone tissue to build. Can a drug solve that problem? It's like, I wish. If it could, it would be a psychedelic drug, right? It would be a drug that deals with the, the psyche. It's not going to be a, it's not going to be a drug that, it, it's a drug that change that shifts someone at the level of consciousness. Not Fosamax. Fosamax doesn't shift at the level. Well, you could say Fosamax might do something at the level of consciousness, but it's going to be, it's going to be a, a downgrade, not an upgrade. Okay, so then all the bone building broths, all the bone, all the weight bearing exercises, like all the things that we know in terms of positive stress or habits that build bone tissue would also have to enter the field of what we know. But the easeful living, getting to the root of the nervous system, not spinning out, that's where the work is. And it's the easeful living as a habit. It's the hardest habit. Everyone always says that. It's the hardest habit. And it's true because it's a habit that it's not like earlier, later dinner, you just do it once a day. Like easeful living is like a 200 time a day habit. <laughs> it's like, shoot, I was stressing out about that thing again. I have to stop. Okay, how am I going to stop? Okay, I'm going to use the, I'm going to use the thought as a trigger, an emotional trigger, and then I'm going to do a new habit. So I'm going to use that as a trigger to take a deep breath. Maybe I'll use it as a trigger to exhale stress from my kidneys. Maybe I'll use it as a trigger to repeat. I am strong. I am wise. I am intuitive. Something like that. Something that reinforces my self-sense. You know, it's like the, the options are infinite. But yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Very, very definitely food for thought, not the food for thought, food for action, really. <laughs> food for food I can do, but you know, the other stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I do like the idea of really going inward and, you know, not just mentally, but physically going inward to for the for my structure for my mental health for my all the other systems because yeah when I think about what how do I feel like I I feel good when I do those I feel good when I do the habits I feel good when I do urine therapy I feel good when I have some kind of calm and it's not just control constricted calm it's relaxed yeah relaxed calm so thank you thank you very much really thank you yeah yeah you're welcome so when i one of the ways that i've experienced this i'm trying to get the keys to okay here we go one of the ways that i've experienced this is like when i really when I've really wanted something to happen, like my tendency is to tell everybody, like tell tell people what you're excited about. And I know I'm not the only one with this. And so it could be that the, one of the key ways to build OGIS is by not talking about it. And what it actually does is it, it, puts, it puts the emphasis on the action. Like what actually comes up is what, what next action should I take? 
So, you know, when people like talk about the thing more than they're doing the thing, how annoying that is, it doesn't matter what the thing is. And sometimes they're just like complaining about the thing instead of just fixing the problem. Right, that's the opposite. So what that does is that disperses the, 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 deep, the deeper intention and energy within the physiology. And so that's why the yogis were so obsessed with like, what is happening at the level of the mind? Like what's happening at the level of the senses? Cause like where the senses goes, the mind goes. So we have to choose, we have to be careful right? About how we do our sense organ self-care. We have to be careful about taking time that has nothing going on so that the mind can unwind a bit, right? Because what comes out of that is what's actually important. So if we don't have off and we're always on, then the, the mind is already in an, in, in an imbalanced state and, and we end up generating I mean, the word, it's interesting. It's like we end up generating more to do that's less in alignment. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite of building ojas. So ojas builds from, from slowness and reflectiveness and, and the habits that slow us down, even the habit of like, say you're a runner, you would start to walk. Say you buy prepared foods, you would start to cook. Say you usually watch something for before bed, you would stop watching or reading, even if it's a nice novel, right? Or a world-class literature, you would stop and you just start having less, just less places, fewer places that you're pointing your attention. If you get 50 emails a day, you would try to reduce the incoming to, to like five. There's a really cool service on roll.me that I love for this, where you just like park a number of email subscriptions, stuff that you then look at when you want. If you are looking at your phone 25 times a day, you would realize the apps, you would 80, 20, and you'd say, well, where's the 20% that I, of, of my attention that I, that I actually want to expand? So I want to expand those. So what's the 80% of things that I have to reduce? And that's a lot, right? It's saying like the majority of things that are pulling up my attention probably don't need to be done, probably won't build my ojas, probably won't build deep restorative energy that'll help rebuild bone tissue. Now, with bone tissue, I can speak from experience. It's a very slow tissue to build. And you all know this, it's not news, but it, when you think about it, right? Like there's a level of patience. So the, the, the datus in Ayurveda are the step down levels of tissue. It's like the tissue that's really easy to build. Those are the first levels of tissue. And it's like plasma, you can build plasma in five days of what you eat. You've got fully mature plasma, 10 days, red blood cells. After that, you start building muscle fiber. After that, fat tissue. After that, bone tissue. After that, bone marrow tissue. So it's interesting about bone and bone marrow. And bone marrow, this is the nervous system tissue, is if the bone marrow tissue has excess energy moving it, if it has a vibration of dissipation, and you can write those words down, Judy, vibration of dissipation. If there's a vibration of dissipation in my mind, I can't build bone tissue because the vibration... The frequency of energy creating the vibration within the bone is dispersing molecules. It's not allowing molecules to actually build the building blocks. And bone tissue is really fascinating. High in air element, high in earth element. You can use a bone. So I, where I live, really different than hiking in Portugal, where I live, there's still a lot of wild animals. So there's a lot of carcasses. So there's a lot of bones lying around. You can use a bone as a weapon. You can use a bone like a baseball bat, right? The femur bone of a large mammal is like a baseball bat, as hard as a rock, right? Like you can smash things with bone. Tensile strength. Bone in Ayurveda, this is what enables the structure to be upright. So cool. It lets us rise against gravity. So the muscles need something to grab onto. That's hard and that's bone. So it has the most earth element of any tissue of the body also has a lot of air element, right? Because bones are light, muscles heavy, fat tissue is pretty heavy, plasma is super heavy, right? All that water weight. 
but bone is light. It's earth and it's light. So the problem is because of the air element, if air element's out of balance at the level of bone tissue, you just have disbursement of molecules and it's not able to build the earth element within the bone. So you have to slow the nervous system down if you're gonna build bone tissue. You just totally blew my mind with that about nerve, about the nervous system being in the bone marrow and why didn't I know that? <laughs> That's amazing. Whoa, okay. Well, and to me, this is too, it, it goes back to that inquiry practice of like, what do I, what do I believe about health? What do I believe about the body? What do I believe about different healing traditions? Because that's a very non-allopathic perspective. And there's a, there's a benefit to those who have studied health. It's very different than those who have studied disease. So if we study bone disease, that's different than studying cultures that have had strong bones. Cultures of people over time that have strong bones. Has anyone ever like, I mean, I live also in the American West and we have a lot of iconology around, around Native Americans or First Peoples. Their teeth are amazing. Their posture's amazing. And teeth and posture are two ways of identifying bone health. Hair is another one. So you can tell like other cultures just knew more. I mean, they just, they, they knew their way of knowing was different than our, our way of knowing. So you guys, I'm not in any way saying like, don't take Fosamax. I'm not advising people around drugs. I'm just advising us around like expanding our awareness into our physiology to understand belief, understanding what other cultures believed about how the body works. But yeah, I know, I hear you on that. Once I kind of, it's so easy to, for me to forget that too, because we live in a culture, and this is, I think, one of the hardest things about belief right now is like we live in a culture that's so allopathically dominant. We're so germ theory dominant. It's hard to understand terrain theory of the microbiome. It's hard to orient from that perspective unless, we're, unless we've in some way risen above our culture, understood other cultures, like literally at the level of, of culturing. And then we choose, and then we get to choose. And what we know happens, I mean, if it's even in like the prisoner's dilemma, you know, the prisoner's dilemma is the prisoners end up taking care of the guards, prisoners that are, <laughs> prisoners that are like, the more abused you are, the more you'll protect your guard. It's really an interesting psychology. So we're, we're a bit, in many ways, trapped in allopathic thinking and allopathic beliefs. And, and we subsidize those, or we pay for those with our taxpayer dollars. So we want to be invested because we're financially invested. And I think that it just adds layers and levels of, of complexity. Okay, so bone and bone marrow, bone marrow tissue. I, I always go back to my, my French grandmother who would just suck the marrow out of bones. And you see this in intact cultures that have relationship with, with the whole animal, if they're eating animals and they have relationship with the whole animal, is they know the value of different tissue. It's like the absolute opposite of American farming, where they're like, people like, like chicken breasts got really in fashion, boneless, skinless chicken breasts. I know it's like the weird, it's the weirdest thing to study for those in food science, like, but basically the food market is based at a, a, a pretty large degree on market demand, which kind of makes sense in a market-based economy. So what we did is like we grew chickens that can't walk because their breasts are too heavy. I think everybody's heard of this by now, but it's it's really the sort of the state of like, what's the quality of bone marrow in those chickens, high or low? Low, because that wasn't the level of tissue that we're after. So unless we're, or, unless we're sourcing organic free range animals to replenish our own nutrient needs around bone and bone marrow, it can be pretty tricky. But this is how humans would eat bone and bone marrow is you would, you would literally gnaw like a dog on a bone and you would suck the marrow out of the bones. And it's very high quality nutrition for someone in, in, in Judy's position. So FYI on that, oxtail soup, 
also great. Any like the knuckles of like the, the knuckles of animals are very high in collagen and that collagen when cooked into a broth, it's more, it's just more accessible than popping a collagen pill in terms of the rates of absorption. So also the diet for someone that has disbursement of energy at the level of nerve is warm, moist, oily, and spiced. Because all that allows the, how are we going to get absorption at the level of bone tissue? Like this is how Ayurveda thinks and it kind of obsesses. It's like, how do we get absorption that, that, that deep in the body? So the qualities of the food have to have the opposite qualities of the disbursement of energy. The qualities that disperse energy, the qualities of wind, highly mobile, cold, light, raw, those energies disperse energy in the, in the nervous system. Yeah. So it's like, oh, what does that look like in a hot summer? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I don't know what cultures have like cold chicken broth soup, but I'm sure there's someone out there that's, or if you live in a fishing climate, so I'm in Portugal right now on the coast. And so there's probably more fish bones. So you'd make like a bouillabaisse. You'd make like a, a, a fish bone broth, same concept. You're still going to get the silica and, and then, and the bones. Yeah. Okay, cool. Julia also has relatives that would suck marrow out of bones. Yep. That's, that's Maja Datu. That's borrowing on the nerve tissue of other mammals. Your Maja is, is nerve tissue. So your marrow is nerve tissue. So you're, you're just, you're, you're taking in the very, very deep nutrition. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I can see in the chat. I mean, people are really getting a lot out of this. I agree. People are getting a lot. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so I will do the things that work for me and that feel right. And they're relaxing my mind and calming down that blessed nervous system in my marrow, which is just, I'm just visualizing it, which is amazing. And I give myself whatever I say, three months, six months, whatever it is. And I don't talk about it. I try not to think about it other than what's good for me. Yeah. What can I do? And what can I do? What's good for me? Is, is ruminating good for me? Nope. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, put it on my calendar, put it, you know, write it down on the calendar right. and say, right. okay. I consider this then. Today, yeah. I think about this. Good. And good. that's, that's, that's the plan. That's the plan. You know, and they come at me with this result, that result. If look, God forbid, emergency, whatever, I'm doing the thing that I need to do. But mm -hmm. at this point, I haven't. And so let's, let's work on this. Let's work on yeah. this plan. Yeah. So that's how you guys like you take something like times of waiting. If you pull a card like that in the I Ching and now as a time of waiting, that's how you you actually are able to take action still. So it's it's not procrastination. It's a it's a conscious engagement with tabling something and building a deeper energy in the process. Good. Well done. You guys have a great week. Investigate your beliefs. Notice the beliefs of others. Yeah. Try to step down that nervous system into spasta. Self-esteem is cellular. Those are my closing thoughts. Namaste. Have a great day.